most coaches are not have no idea what the CLA is. And if they do, they don't use anything of it at all. So can you talk about where we are in kind of the AAU universe and and how we are training players and why actually the CLA would be more efficient and effective for our player development for them on the court? But I think even more importantly, it helps you become a better just person off the court. Yeah, absolutely. Um, It's funny. The thing that made me realize how far behind we were actually was like about a year ago, I was watching the the David Beckham documentary. I don't know if you've... If you've watched that, I've seen, it, but I've, I've seen uh, the trailer. Fantastic. Absolutely loved it. Um, I got a lot of things from it. But one thing that I did notice was they were talking about his training at one point and they were talking about, they brought up, mentioned small sided games. And you are listening to the Beyond the Scoreboard podcast, transforming athletes into leaders on and off the court with host Coach Furtado. Coaches, are you ready to take your passion for coaching and turn it into a full-time career? I know the challenge is firsthand, but the Make Money Coaching Sports program helped me take BTG basketball full-time. If you're tired of juggling coaching part-time and want to fully focus on doing what you love, this business accelerator will give you the tools and support to make it happen. Hit the link in the show notes below to learn more and start living your dream. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Beyond the Scoreboard podcast. Our guest today is Alex Silva. Alex is a player development coach with Adapt Academy in San Diego. Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So before we dive into what Adapt Academy is and how it's innovating the basketball landscape, I'd love to get to know you and get the opportunity to to, for the listeners to get to know you as well. How did basketball have an impact on your life beyond the scoreboard? I think that the best way for me to describe it is I think, you know, growing up, basketball was my entire life. I had the dream that everyone had uh, going to the NBA, doing all that. But I think when I really realized that basketball was going to be my entire life was I didn't have the, let's say, greatest relationship with my high school coach. And it really left a pretty uh, bad taste in my mouth for what coaches were. Um, and, you know, I always looked for my, my coach or, you know, um, to be, to be a leader to me, to be like a mentor to me. And I don't, I never felt like I really got that, that true authentic experience. Like you see, like, I don't know, on TV and stuff like that, but as a kid, that's all, that's all you really have. But that, that, those relationships are are real. And so I kind of was just like, you know, going into college, I remember my dad asking me, being like, so what are you going to do? I was like, basketball. I was like, what do you mean? Like, yeah, but like, what are you going to do? I'm like, I'm telling you, like, I don't know what it is, but it's going to be basketball. Because it just, I never wanted another athlete to feel as though they didn't have the ability to make a connection with their coach. Obviously, players, you know, and coaches, they have varying different relationships. And it's not always going to be perfect. It's not always going to be like this you know, the blind side type story, but you know, you should feel as though you have the ability to create that relationship with somebody. And that, you know, it's not every time you come to practice, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to win this person over. I'm trying to, you know what I mean? So that's, that's where, that's where basketball became kind of like my, my mission is like, how many people can I impact? Um, like through the game that, that I love. I love that. And so let, let's kind of like, Almost, I I don't know if I want to say define or or give your definition of what that connection, that player relationship, what coaches should strive for in that mentorship role. Because I do feel like that is the most important aspect of you sports coaching, which is what me and you are doing right now. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it it, it could be, I I think it could be anything, really. It could be something as simple as like, you have a life question about like college or what career you want to do. You know, maybe your coach was a painter for a long period of time and you can ask him like, Hey man, like, did you love painting? Or like, do you think I really need to go to college? Do you think? So like, it could be something as simple as that, or it could be something, something like you have, you know, some, some family questions or some life questions that come up. I felt like I had all of these various different needs that I wanted to connect with my coach on because I didn't know who else to go to. And I'm spending so much time with this you know, person um, who's guiding me to write the promised land in basketball, like, you know, you want to be able to like turn to them and just, just have that ability. So I don't know if it's something in specific, 
that I can like point to and be like, this is it. But I just think again, it's just like the ability to feel like no matter what I need to go to this person for, they have my back. Obviously, within reason, but hundred percent. I think a couple of things that I hear within there is like are being like a coach that's approachable, right? That I like, you know, a player can go and have, you know, obviously it takes trust to right ask some of those questions that you're kind of alluding to as well. I um, mean, just being able to connect in that way, I, I really like kind of that that perspective that you gave there. So before we kind of dive into how you approach coaching, uh, can you kind of fill us in on, on the your basketball journey, and, and I know you're from the East Coast, from Rhode Island, and how you eventually got out to San Diego. Yeah, absolutely. So I I left high school, um, again, kind of with the mentality of like, I, I just, you just, as a kid, you don't really know. And especially in 2016, when I was a senior, I feel like we were right on the cusp, right, of like, the information that we have now as far as recruiting goes. So like, what is the actual process? In my mind, I was going to go out, score my points, do what I had to do, dive all over the floor. And there was going to be coaches just in the stands, just sitting there. Like they knew who I was and, and they don't, they had no idea who I was. Right. So I didn't really do my due diligence. I didn't email anyone. I didn't reach out. So long story short, my best friend in high school, um, was also the point guard on my basketball team. And I decided that I was going to go with him to Franklin Pierce University, which is a Division II school in New Hampshire. And uh, they were recruiting him to go there. So I said, all right, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to try out for the team. We're just going to run this back. Four years, fresh start. And uh, it didn't work out like that. Um, he ended up not attending the school for personal reasons. And then I was left all by myself at a school that I wasn't good enough to play at. And so long story short, I started kind of coaching and just hanging around the team, ended up getting, getting to do a couple of internships as a coach's assistant, doing some player development stuff with the guys in the off season. I spent the entire off season up there with one of my good friends, Doyen, who was on the team, did his player development for the entire summer with him and really just got the opportunity to see like how a college basketball program worked from top to bottom, sitting in on coaches meetings, doing scouting reports, all of that stuff. And uh, that's really where I started to fall in love with the idea of like, okay, I think I could be a basketball coach and I think I could be a pretty good one. Ironically enough, I was trying to try out for the men's team for my second time and we were playing pickup and after the, the women's basketball team played pickup and the coach kind of came up to us and like the, you know, the guys that were on the, the cusp. It's like, hey, we need a couple of extra bodies for, for pickup later. Like, do you think, you know, you guys can stay and just kind of like, you know, jump in? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Like, I don't care, whatever. It was immediately after that pickup where she came up to me and was like, you really know what you're talking about. Like, have you ever thought about coaching? And that like just nail in the coffin. I was like, all right, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm just going to dedicate my, my life to it. So I did that. Did that for my, my three years. COVID happened. And then um, I was supposed to go out to Texas to coach at a small JUCO school out there. I had some family that lived out there. So I was like, all right, let's go. Obviously, COVID happened and my season got canceled. So I had nowhere to go. That's when I moved to Massachusetts, started co coaching high school basketball. And uh, to make a long story even longer, uh, I ended up working with uh, Tyler LeClaire, who's a player development coach out in Massachusetts, one of the best in the, in the country. So I got to work with him for a while, met Cole. One thing led to another. Now I'm in San Diego. That's cool. I really like the, the kind of part of the story where someone, you know, saw, you know, potential in you as a coach, right? And, and I'm sure at that time, you know, you were, we're at the stage of your life where you wanted to play, right? It's, you know, we don't want to coach. We don't want to hang up the shoes quite yet. But that person saw that that potential and that kind of led to to things snowballing down. Um, as you kind of alluded to, you got the opportunity to work with Tyler. Tyler's been on the podcast before a little bit over a year ago now. Um, and one of my things that I've been kind of obviously I'm learning and, and of course you're big on um, is the CLA approach. So I, I'd love for you to kind of give the opportunity to to share what you've learned from a lot of the coaches that you got an opportunity to work for, whether it's in New Hampshire or with Tyler. Yeah. You take little bits of like everybody's, you know, 
coaching styles and you kind of form it into your own. Um, but that's with that, anything in life, but it's just so funny to see how far like my mentality has come as far as player development goes and just kind of at first doing what worked for me and the things that I liked and then taking a little bit from here and a little bit from there. But Tyler was, I mean, like without him, I really wouldn't have the, the knowledge that I have now because obviously spending as much time as I did with him and being able to ask him questions. Um, he is a really good teacher. Um, and so that was great for me to kind of learn this, this new style of, you know, and, and kind of connecting the dots in my own training and being like, Oh, I always knew that I liked doing this as a player. And I felt like it, it gave me the best like feel as a player. Now I have a scientific rationale behind why I, I like that as a player I was like I can totally get behind the CLA and you know small-sided games etc right no 100 percent. and so you know I feel like for those that are listening like I've been talking about it a little bit but can you kind of remind some of the listeners or for some of the maybe new, new listeners what is the CLA and how is it different than from a traditional basketball training coaching perspective I would just say the CLA in short is basically it you're you're putting yourself in a situation but you're giving yourself a limited amount of ways to solve the situation so you're creating a lot of our training is just creating a smaller version of the game putting constraints on it um hence constraints led approach but putting a constraint on it to maybe only give you a limited amount of solutions to that problem therefore as a player is kind of going through they're going to start to see some of these different solutions that maybe before if they were able to do whatever they want um kind of start to emerge I think that's the easiest, I, I want to say like the easiest way is like literally just taking like a conventional drill, but making it more difficult through limiting the actual things that you can do. Right. No, hundred percent. And then I know we'll kind of get to this here in a second, but before I kind of get into adapt Academy and you're kind of talking about the constraint led approach and giving players the opportunity to create and kind of be problem solvers and be, become more adaptable. I want to kind of go to where we are kind of in a basketball universe and I feel like I'm I'm kind of deeper into the CLA movement but when I go and like look out even here in Los Angeles I don't know what it's like in San Diego or Massachusetts but most coaches are not have no idea what the CLA is and if they do they don't use anything out of it at all so can you talk about where we are in kind of the AAU universe and, and how we are training players and why actually the CLA would be more efficient and effective for our player development for them on the court. But I think even more importantly, it helps you become a better just person off the court. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's funny. The thing that made me realize how far behind we were actually was like about a year ago, I was watching the, uh, the David Beckham documentary. I don't know if you've, okay. if you've watched I've that, seen it, but I've, I've seen uh, the trailer. Fantastic. Absolutely loved it. Um, I got a lot of things from it. But one thing that I did notice was they were talking about his training at one point and they were talking about, they brought up, mentioned small sided games. And I, I mean, I don't, you know, historically where David Beckham was, but it was probably like what, early 2000s that, you know, he was kind of, yeah. right? And so well, I'm we sitting were in there and middle I'm like, school, high school, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And, and I'm like, wow, they've been using small sided games, a term that I had never even heard in yeah. the States until working with Tyler, until kind right. of doing some extra research and really digging into things. So, I mean, even that was just eye opening to me to just to see like how far ahead the game of soccer is um, with this. And then when you look at basketball, it's if a coach is doing it, like you said, they don't even realize that they are doing it. But I right. do want to, I do think that more coaches are doing it. Uh, training like this they just don't understand why and i think that's the biggest problem is coaches will see a drill they'll see a a, a a setup of something and they're like this is great let me do a series of my drills mm. to build us mm. up to this and then right. throw this drill that they saw online that you know cole gabe tyler somebody said was a great drill for this and now all of a sudden they're like this is it right i'm using it I'm doing it. 
But like, you mm. really need to understand like how to manipulate these drills and how to change the constraints within the drills to actually work with your players. And I just think, frankly, it just comes down to like, it's time consuming to learn it is. a new skill, right? It's really a new skill. It's a skill of teaching. It is. It's, it's completely different. I kind of, to kind of give the long story short, I actually, Tyler's the first person that I saw that was doing it. Um, and so I kind of just binged a ton of his videos. And now I'm kind of on the transforming basketball uh, binge with Alex. Like I love, I love what he's doing. And, um, you know, I've read his book. His book's normally up here, but I was actually reading it this morning because I'm trying to re go through all the principles because even like, I don't remember everything that he, it's, it's, it's a lot. Like you talk about, it's very time consuming. Like I've spent like, pretty much this entire 2024 year, all my basketball learnings have all been that. And I don't even, I'm like barely scratching the surface. But when I started, all I was kind of doing was, um, was kind of taking some of Tyler's drills. And I think now I like, I know the, the purpose of constraints, right? And um, I'd love for, to give you kind of the opportunity to talk about what, how constraints like really help players become more adaptable in the solutions they find in the, in the different type of constraints that you can use. Yeah. So I think, you know, let's take a player that uh, loves, maybe they love a spin move, right? Every time they get to the basket, they're always spinning through traffic, whatever. That's like their cool. thing, right? We can take that player and we can say a multitude of different things, right? If you put them hip to hip with somebody in the middle of the free throw line and you say, when I say go, you're going to go make this layup any way that you can. More often than not, depending on how often we're talking about this addiction to the spin move, right? it's going to come out a lot more than a Euro step or something less utilized by that player. Now, some moves are great and players use them at the perfect time. And that's what makes them great, right? Everyone has their little signature move or what they do. But if you notice that, let's say that spin move is becoming a problem. Now we can limit it to something as simple as you can't spin or you have to cut the player off. This is going to force that player that so often would kind of fall back on that spin move. They're going to have to try new things. They're going to have to try to get in front of somebody. They're going to have to try to bump somebody with a dribble. They're going to have to use an extension. And when you can start to change the defense, maybe there's a super tall player, maybe there's a super short player, right? All these different things that we're, I'm kind of talking about changing, those are all constraints and just mixing it up and just giving them an opportunity to see a situation, recognize an affordance, and then just kind of capitalize on that from there. So now it's kind of a segue into kind of Adapt Academy and what you're building down there and, and also in Miami. Can you talk about, you know, like I know, I know the reasons why, like manipulating all these constraints and providing them different opportunities and affordances um, helps them become more adaptable, which, you know, helps them become better basketball players. But I'd love for you to give your kind of definitions of and thoughts on how these constraints actually help basketball become basketball players become more adaptable and why adaptable basketball players are better i think i think two things come to mind the first is it's a lot more fun and the more fun and again this is just for me and the things that i put an emphasis on but when when you can make your training a lot more fun and players are more willing to kind of show up it gives you kind of leeway to coach them in multiple directions um and i think the you know, kind of the, the second thing, which is kind of what we talked about earlier, like a, almost trying to get them to have like an aha moment, like where they're just like, you see the light bulb, literally like a cartoon, like a light bulb would just go off above their head. Um, that for me is super important because I remember all of my aha moments on the court. I remember doing something and being like, that works. Why don't I do that all the time? Right. Um, something that's super important. So I feel like through, um, you know, kind of the CLA and through giving them, you know, their own, um, their own ability to solve some of these problems, we can really generate those aha moments and help them learn a lot faster. And then I guess the second part of your question, which is like adapt, building an adapt adaptable athlete. I think obviously having an adaptable athlete on the court is great. Nothing is going to kind of phase them. Nothing will get in their way. 
the game is changing so fast. The fast that we can get our players to adapt to that obviously is going to be beneficial. But I think the biggest implications come off the court and how the athlete deals with different problems and different things that are going to arise in their life. I think that obviously basketball and sports is an excellent tool for building a lot of like leadership qualities and just general qualities like within the human being, but building somebody who is adaptable, who whether they're up, down, whatever's happening in the game, that they can adapt to that and they can kind of keep their demeanor the same. You can't argue with me that that isn't beneficial for a person to have once they finish playing for you or finish playing a sport um, in general. No, 100%. And, and so I'll kind of recap because you gave a, gave a lot of really good insights into, you know, why the CLA is more effective. I think, number one, it, it's more fun, which leads to more engagement. When you have a player that's more engaged, you're going to want to get better. They're going to want to be more invested at your training session, your practice, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, number two, it's kind of having that aha moment, it's that connection to the game. And that's kind of been my big one of the big things that I really enjoy about it is like I like see people like do moves that they've never practiced on air before or maybe they've, they've seen it before. They've seen it done but like they didn't even know it was possible. And so like being able to make those connections is so cool. And I'm um, also just, yeah, the adaptability off the court and that's, what's most important. So I'd love to give, you know, kind of this next chapter, this next quarter of our podcast, an opportunity to talk about at adapt Academy and how you are, you know, obviously you're creating more adaptable athletes on the court, but more importantly, more adaptable athletes off the court. Yeah. I think the, the coolest thing for me was I remember when I met uh, York, for the first time, York Michaels from um, Belgium. And he came and spoke at one of our uh, player development conferences that we had held with Mastery Hoops. And I remember him telling kind of the story of the um, academy that he had built out there and kind of talking about that style and that kind of all encompassing style of. Um, you know, of, of basketball and the, the European model, we'll call it, um, as, it's, as it's been coined now. I brought that home with me and wanted to do that with the AAU program that I was working for at the time. And they kind of were bought in, but at the same time, they were kind of just like, eh, that seems like a lot of work. Like, I don't know if we want to switch everything over, over to that. Um, so it never, it never ended up working out. And then, you know, fast forward a couple of months, I'm out in Miami with, with Cole and he's telling me how they're going to do it. They're going to start it up. He was like really awesome. Even before I worked with him about kind of, you know, sitting down with me and talking to me about like, okay, you've done this, you've tried to do it without, you know, the support of the program. How would you do it if you had like the full support? of a program. If you had somebody like myself who was like, whatever you need, I got you. Um, which kind of spawned the idea of Adapt Academy with, uh, with Gabe and Cole. So uh, Adapt Academy is really just a opportunity for, you know, athletes to come in and to get everything that they need to develop on and off the court in one place. I think, uh, like guys right now, especially like, you know, when I was back in Massachusetts, they would be training with Tyler and then they would be doing their strength conditioning down the, down the road with somebody else. And then they'd be, who knows if they were watching film or studying the game or whatever on their own free time. And then they'd be going to AAU practice two or three times a week and playing pickup there. And then they'd be, so they had all these like different avenues where they were trying to learn, which is great. I think that everybody should get as around as many different minds and collect as many different perspectives as you can. But uh, what we're trying to offer is a community of coaches and people that can give you those different perspectives in one straight line that's going to get you to your goal, um, whatever that may be as an athlete. No, I like that. And, and so can you kind of dive into kind of the all-encompassing model? What does that include? So you talked about the one-stop shop, right? You talked about the strength and conditioning, obviously on core skills, film, um, life leadership, kind of what is a day in the life? What's a week in the life, a month in the life at, with an Adapt Academy program? Yeah. So day in the life, or I'm sorry, week in the life of kind of what we do here. Monday, we have a skill session. 
um, prior to the start of their practice. So an individual skill session. Um, and I think the great, the, the great thing about this is it's, it's year round, right? So we have our high school guys that show up before that to do their training. Um, and then we go into, you know, our different practices for our teams on a Monday night. So we have, you know, our, uh, black and white teams that practice from six to seven thirty, And then from seven to 30, we have our gold team, uh, come in and they practice from seven thirty to nine. And like I said, we have the skills training, uh, blended in before. So each athlete is going to be able to kind of do some individual work, not just like the team stuff. Tuesday, we have performance. Um, Wednesday, so weight room, uh, Wednesday, we have, uh, again, similar schedule to Monday skills, uh, team practice. And then Thursday, we have a second performance session, a skill session before that. And then kind of like a more open run slash practice, um, where we just do a lot of tactical work, um, three on three, four on four, five on five different situations, even if there's situations and triggers that we necessarily don't use. On a regular basis, we like to give guys the opportunity to play out a bunch of different things because you never know, one, what's going to help your team, or two, um, what's going to help their you know, own middle school, high school teams um, in the future. So you have no idea. So I would say that's a typical week for us. And then we play games on the weekend, whether it's a local league or you know, we try to do one to two tournaments um, per month. No, no more than that, but the, the leagues have been great going in, playing one game on the weekend, and then getting back into our, our regular schedule. 100%. So I know that you all started with, with some of the high school guys in kind of the typical time, like the February, March. Can you talk about how over time, like through the spring and summer, you saw, you know, if you could share any personal stories from some certain kids or just general team growth, um, that'd be a great opportunity for me to kind of get a and the listeners to get an understanding of how this program, like all being all in one can really help and impact kids, you know, instead of having them go to all these different places. Mm -hmm. I, so I personally only moved here to San Diego a month ago. So I missed yeah. right. That big chunk of like the, the San Diego guys development. But I've been out to South Florida and what Cole and uh, e, Eli, Mike, all those guys are doing out there at um, Detail Miami, which is essentially the same thing that we have going on in San Diego, just on the East Coast. Um, right. So I can kind of speak on it because I've been out there, you know, one, I think sometime in the winter and then again in the summer. And then again, at the end of the summer, so I did get to kind of see like a little bit of kind of their process over there. And I think the coolest thing that I saw was, and again, this is less, less the basketball, more the person, but like showing up and like seeing a kid going up to him, introducing, you know, myself as part of the culture is in our gyms, like everyone has to say what's up to everybody, you know, little, little guy walking in the gym, or, you know, you could be a pro athlete. You've got to go say what's up to everybody. And I'm going up to these guys and just being like, yo, what's going on, man? I'm, I'm Coach Silva. And uh, you get like that that shelled, just like, you know, scared kid that's just kind of like, yeah, what's, like, what's up, man? And then boom, you come back two months later and like, you know, maybe you walk in there like, yo, what's up, coach? And then they keep it. And then yeah. you come back two months later and now all of a sudden they're walking in like, yo, where you been, man? Like, yeah. and I think like seeing how, you know, being around and, and having to interact and answer as many questions as we ask and do all of these things, it just really brings out like this different side of, um, of the athlete that you, it might've taken a lot longer to come out had they not been in this like family environment just constantly. I mean, we see these guys a lot, right? Four or five days out of the week, sometimes six, depending on how many games you play. It's like, we really have the ability to kind of full circle to what I was talking about at the beginning. Like you really have the ability to be there if they, if they will allow you to. I love that. And, and so we, you said you have, you say what's up to everyone. And, and is that a culture? Is, are the athletes expected to do that too? Cause I do that as a coach, but I kind of like the idea of, of putting the responsibility on the athletes. And like, I do it. Like if I have a, a new, new kid coming to a session, I'm like, Hey, like, make sure you introduce yourself. But I kind of like the idea of, of making it a responsibility that everyone has to say what's up to everyone in the gym. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the, the guys, the girls in the training, like, 
They know. Like, they walk into yeah. the gym. And almost to the point of, like, this is kind of funny. Like, when I first got out here, I would be coaching and, you know, the, the gold team. So I'm coaching black and the gold team walks in. And the guys are, like, walking onto the court and they're like, yo, what's up, coach? And, like, dap me up. And then, like, go up to all the players and dap everyone up. And I'm like, like, y'all, like, we're in the middle of practice right now. You know what I mean? But right, right, that right. is, like, that is the culture of just, like, and they're yeah. just they're just so accustomed to just coming in, just being like, what's up, what's up? Their parents are in the gym. They're saying hi to everybody. Parents are saying hi to kids. Kids are saying hi to other parents. Session before, session after. I, it's right just on. such a cool thing and i like i I was like you like i would go up and say hi to everybody right because my right. my college coach coach chadborn i like one of the greatest people i've ever met he used to every single day come in shake every single person's hand in the gym right and talk to them for 30 seconds but like right. the things that he was able to talk to us about and like that connection that he made like i was just like i felt so special in that moment with my coach so i try to replicate that but then getting here and seeing them do it like with everybody, I was like, okay, I immediately saw like how that, that impacted the culture here for sure. I like that. And I can almost, I can imagine, you know, that, that first month or two, like right when you're kind of doing it was, especially with boys, especially my girls are definitely would have an easier time doing it, but the guys are like, you know, they're a little awkward. They're like, you know, especially if it's someone new that's coming in the gym, they're like, what's up, man? Like yep. I've been having them like do certain things where, where they pair up with each other, um, especially I'm, and, and they can't go to the same school. And then they're like, have to talk about their day. And like, I'm like, what's your favorite NBA team? Like little, little things like that to try and build that communication. But I like creating that as a cultural point. You got to say what's up to everyone. Cause it's so, it's such a little thing, but it's mm -hmm. like, a, it's amazing what it can really do. And it's, it's, it's tough at first to, um, like anything, cause we, we had rules at Tyler's gym as well. And it's just like the beginning part is just like policing it. Right. And just like constantly like reminding the kids and it's, and it's, it's tough on us. Cause it's another thing that we have to do while we're worried about experience and training and, you know, like making sure every kid has a good time and making sure we're saying hi to everybody. Like now we have to constantly yeah. watch, but, um, it's it's worth it in the end because I just think that the, the benefits that you can have from creating that culture, like, again, you can't argue that it's a negative, you know? No, it's not. Yeah, it just takes time, right? Kind of what we we're talking about. But I feel like if you really want to have a program like Adapt Academy at BTG, I'm trying my goal. Like I had Gabe on the podcast. I think it, were, it was around this time last year and we kind of had a conversation. I knew he was kind of going to get into this. And I knew that this is something that I, I'm trying to kind of build a similar model that adapt is doing through btg and uh, there's just so much so many similarities that are there any other like cultural things that are a part of adapt that you know not only btg could also adapt but also like some of the coaches that are listening either it could be for their high school program or their club programs whatever they got i think i'm trying to think that's a great question and i'm sure if, if one pops up i will think but i think cultural on the sense of like how we operate on a day-to-day -day basis i think yeah. like whether it's doing a seminar on college recruiting we have you know resources for parents to to kind of understand what a good sports parent looks like um and not from my point of view like i don't right like it's not right. i'm not a scientist i'm not telling i'm talking about like the legitimate research done on what is the most beneficial for your your athlete um so we like to provide them with like information like that where they can read they can go listen to podcasts they can do stuff like that having a seminar on october 8th i believe we have a uh, culture seminar that we're doing at the local rec center and we're inviting you know all the the families um, and their parents to, to come on by and, and we're going to serve food and kind of present to them and let them know like, hey, this is our culture. This is why we do certain things. This is why we use certain language. So we just try to keep parents um, and families like as involved as, as humanly possible in everything that we do. And just, again, just try to do the, these little like watching film with the guys, doing stuff like that. We do team events every single month uh, where we we already have like the rest of the year planned out. We're going. October is uh, pickleball, and I think uh, November, I forget what November is, but we just went to the beach the other day, played spike ball. So just doing little things like that where we can uh, 
again, just, just create more opportunities for guys to bond and, and connect with each other um, and families to, to get to know each other as well, I think is super important if you want to have like a really good culture, a really good like community. Because you need you need everybody to be working together if you want to make this style uh, work. Because it, it's a lot. It's, it's time consuming, man. It's a lot. It is. It is. Yeah. No. As I, as I'm kind of hearing you talk, right? It's, it's all these different events that kind of add up on each other, and um, but that that's what it's about. I feel like that if you really want to separate, like, and kind of just doing, we'll, we'll go kind of fourth quarter of the podcast. Separate ourselves because we don't want to be like the other AAU programs, like you know where you see kids jumping from team to team all they care about is playing games like if you really want to be entrenched in their development like i feel like it takes a lot of intentional energy and time i mean that's it right it it takes it takes time it takes but the i think the reasoning behind why we're doing it is it, it makes it matches with the amount of work that you have to put in like it's it's a big goal to help an athlete do everything that they want to do in their athletic right. journey and be a mentor right. for them and develop them off the court, you know, and be like, like we're literally essentially in, in what you're doing, what I'm doing, saying that we want to be fully responsible for an athlete's like early development, like put that yeah. weight on us, you know? And so like we should be spending this much time, if not more, um right. around basketball and around our athletes because like like people will say all the time be like damn y- y'all do that like seems like a lot of you know seems like a lot of work i'm like yeah like these are yeah young people that were developing right right no 100 percent. and and, and the, the, it's our future and so kind of i have a kind of a sidebar question as far as like, because academics are incredibly important for this, you know, this age group and right, getting them to college, whether they're going to play college basketball or not, um, is something that we are striving to do and, and creating program for. Do y'all do, you know, since it's they spend a lot of time with y'all, do you, do you guys do like homework time? Or is that like, how, how do you help them with kind of their academic side? Yeah, we I personally have not assigned any. Um, oh, all right. So I was going to say we do homework within adapt like we'll do film assignments and stuff like that right, right, making right. the kids i personally haven't partaken in that just yet um i'm trying to still be the the nice cop for a little while and uh make sure my guys cool. my guys aren't getting too mad like damn coach gave us gave us homework again tonight yeah yeah but um but as far as the academics go i know it's a high priority for us and we've been in constant um discussion on how we can kind of rope um academics into uh adapt whether that be um requiring players to maintain a certain level um of you know athletics uh i'm sorry academic standing or maybe it's something where like we can reward them for if they have over a certain you know gpa we can give them financial aid like like a university would um to hopefully help motivate them to not only come in and get a discounted rate for us but be able to unlock more opportunities um for their for their you know college education as well no i love it i love it and so kind of we we, we've touched on a lot of things if you could boil down for the coaches that are listening and and even the parents like what would you say like three things um that they could do to to potentially add to their program to really help athletes become more adaptable and, and develop holistically three things one prioritize your culture um and understand what that is like understand what it is you want to build i think that's that's the first the most important thing that is going to be the most time consuming that is going to be you know but if you build it from the beginning and you do your due diligence to uh bring in good families bring in good athletes good people and surround yourself with that and you don't get greedy I think that that is going to be the most important thing moving forward because now you're only going to, by default, um, you know, bring in other people of a similar um, belief. So I, I would say that, number one, the most important thing. I would say number two, just try to 
provide as much development as possible for your athletes. I think a lot of times coaches and programs focus way too much on winning and way too much on the actual result on Saturday and Sunday. Um, so they spend their practice time going over plays and sets and all of that. And that's fantastic. However, I promise you when they go and play high school basketball or they go and play middle school basketball, not one of your sets are going to be in the coach's nope. playbook because there's nope. so many plays in the world right now. There's so many different playing styles. Just teach the guys and girls how to hoop. And that's it. Just teach them where to be, how to space the floor, how to react to each other. And then I think you'll have a lot of success. And three, three is tough. I, I'll have to get back to you on the third one. But I think, I, I think those two, two. Are, are, are pretty solid for where we should be. I love it. And I kind of want to add on to what you kind of said there. that I, Something I've been thinking about quite a bit. And it's not really novel at all. Um, you know, Nick Saban has this, I was listening to, I was just on a plane. I was flying back. I was listening to him and Bill Belichick talk. There's like a HBO max special on them. So I had to, you know, find some entertainment on the way back. That, you know, I thought it could be educational. Um, and so he kind of had this saying and he, he talked about like winning is an outcome. It's not the goal, right. Kind of to what your point, like development is the actual goal because if we develop them to become better shooters decision makers finishers defenders that's going to lead to the outcome we want and that's kind of really changed kind of how i view coaching and, and training and and so i'm you know i'm really looking forward to that so uh, with that being said where can people find and, and connect with you and learn more about adapt academy uh well we have the um, Adapt Academy Instagram page. Um, I have my personal Instagram, uh, by any means Silva, by any means basketball on YouTube is another, another great way to kind of connect with us. But, um, uh, yeah, I would say that's it. I'm on Twitter, but I'm on Twitter sparingly. I go on every once in a while, take a couple scrolls and they get off. So. Yep. Right on. I appreciate your time today, Alex. Um, I got a, a full page of notes here and always love taking little tidbits from different, you know, people that I have on the podcast, different organizations that we can implement in because the podcast, the purpose is to impact kids beyond the scoreboard. Most of them aren't going to play college basketball. And if they do, they most of them won't play professional basketball. So how can we create that greatest possible experience for them right now? So love what y'all are doing over at Adapt. Yeah, likewise, man. Thank you. I appreciate you you giving us the opportunity to kind of talk about what we have going on. And you guys got got LA cover, and we got we got San Diego. So we'll be able to hopefully make some some significant impact in the in the coming years. It's stopping. I think it should be stopping. Collab coming soon, though. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Beyond the Scoreboard podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure that you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and share it with a friend, coach, or parent you feel like would get value from this episode. It's our responsibility to impact as many parents and coaches who are the ones that are impacting our athletes. That's how we create a ripple effect. So thank you for being a part of our community, and we look forward to serving you all next week.